now move to the motion before the House tonight, which is, this House would never ally with authoritarian regimes. I now look to the first speaker, the Member of Standing Committee, Charles Wang, Hartford College, to open the case for the proposition. Thank you, Madam President, and it is an honour and a dream come true for me to stand here tonight and debate in the historical Oxford Union, a place that was founded on the principles of free speech, something that I'm obviously very familiar with as an international student from mainland China. Actually, before tonight, some people were a bit worried, fearing that I wouldn't know what free speech meant. So I asked my American friend to define it for me, and he told me, in my country, I can freely and openly criticize my president. And I responded, so what? In my country, I can also freely and openly criticize your president as well. <laughs> so all jokes aside, as I grew up in mainland China, tonight's debate is incredibly special to me. In fact, if I were here 10 years ago, I'm afraid I'll be defending the opposition. Because after the famous ping pong diplomacy that jump started the US-China relations in the 80s, the increasing international cooperation seemed to be facilitating the um, political and social transformation within China itself. We transitioned to capitalism, or what we call socialism with Chinese characteristics. We joined WTO and started international trade, and we even embraced Western pop culture, introducing foreign TV series, the first of which, surprisingly, is Baywatch, starring David Hasselhoff. However, somewhere along the line, things took a very unexpected turn. Today, I'm sorry to say, but China has one of the world's most censored internet and is now banning apps and tools which help users bypass what we call the Great Firewall of China. The government has increased crackdown on human rights activists, now targeting lawyers who dare to provide legal assistance. And social media censorship has expanded so much that if a group chat member shares some sensitive information, Others in the same group chat can be held responsible for not reporting it in time. In short, in the case of China, greater economic alliance with other democracies did not lead to social and democratic transformation. But before I go into my arguments tonight in greater details, it falls upon me to introduce our position speaker. So tonight's debate motion is extremely complicated, and to answer it, it will require extensive experience in international relations a delicate understanding of regional geopolitics, and years on the field personal engagement. All of which are qualities I'm sure Mr. Nick Brown, our first pro our opposition speaker, possesses. After all, at the first year PP East, up to today, <laughs> Mr. Brown has been studying politics for a lengthy period of nine weeks and four days. <laughs> Second, we have Ms. Gabrielle Rifkin an expert in conflict resolution in the Middle East, and it's incredibly fitting that she's speaking again tonight at the Oxford Union, a place that is also known for its political instability and constant power struggles. <laughs> I hope that perhaps after the debate, she might use her extensive experience in helping us on the committee also advance a two-slate solution. <laughs> Lastly, we welcome former World Bank President Deputy Defense Secretary and U.S. Ambassador Paul Wolfowitz. Given what has happened in America in the past year, I'm not surprised to see him speaking for the opposition. In fact, I think he'll be proposing, uh, so he'll be opposing that, uh, proposing that democracy should not only ally with authoritarian regimes, but warmly invite them to participate in domestic elections. <laughs> Madam President, these are your speakers, and they are most welcome. <laughs> So, my main argument tonight will consist of three major questions. First, do authoritarian regimes violate basic human rights that we find intolerable in a modern society? Second, do democracies have ob obligations to prevent or at least not facilitate such atrocities? And if your answer to both of the above questions are a resounding yes, then my third question will be, how do economic, political, or military alliance with authoritarian regimes coming to this picture? Simply put, do they make matters better or make them worse? So let's tackle the first question. 
And you can call me an idealist as much as you want, but I do believe that there exist certain unalienable human rights that we should and must enjoy by virtue of being humans. They can include rights to life, property and fair trial, or freedom from torture, slavery and unfair detainment. These are not things that would be nice for us to have, like pumping spice latte or stable agile room connections, but they are essential components of a life that is at least worth living. And yet, across authoritarian regimes, we see them violated in many different ways. In parts of Africa and the Middle East, sorry, I, don't, I, do, I am on a schedule here. Genital mutilation <laughs> is still a common practice. In those countries, in those authoritarian regimes, we see 14-year-old girls who have their most intimate organs damaged just to reinforce the patriarchal social norms of female purity and sexual modesty. Across Asia, we see civil rights activists who are taken by the government as political prisoners without any form of dual process. And this is exemplified in the sad passing of Liu Xiaobo, a Nobel Peace Prize laureate who was sentenced to a decade of imprisonment despite only advocating for nonviolent forms of protest. And he died of cancer in prison without receiving any adequate medical treatment. And to put this into perspective, the only other Nobel laureate who also died in prison was a German pacifist, and he died in a Nazi concentration camp. So here I'm saying that when we talk about human rights abuses in authoritarian regimes, we are not saying that they're uns just uns unsavory, unpleasant, or that they raise his eyebrows, but that they are an affront to humanity and they should have no place in any modern society. So, if those human rights violations are indeed so terrible, should democracy try to do something or just let it happen? We've seen dictators arguing that their own national sovereignty outweighs the other democracies' right to interfere or to criticize. But what I will argue is that when the UN was founded in 1945, uh, when the International Criminal Court was founded in, in 1998, and when the UN, UN Human Rights Commission was founded in 2006, we see countries, especially democracy, recognizing that for the new order to work, countries need to come together and step up their effort, especially when things get difficult. On the other hand, dictators will sometimes argue that even democracies themselves might not be the best examples of human rights offenders. Qu quoting from a certain US president, well, you think our country are so innocent? We got lots of killers too. <laughs> but I will argue that indeed, sometimes democracy can go wrong and human rights intervention can lead to unexpected outcomes. But the key here is to keep on trying. It is one thing to admit that our current efforts are not perfect, but there's another to use it as an excuse to justify inaction in the face of atrocities. Sorry. And democracies might not get it right the first time, but I will argue that at least let's try something. So now, let's turn to the last and perhaps the most complicated question of them all. Do democratic alliance with authoritarian regimes improve? or worsen those human rights violations. And a lot of people, I believe including the opposition, will often argue that alliance between democra democracies and dictatorships might in fact promote democratic transformation. And they argue that economic prosperity and social interaction as a result of the alliance might lead to gradual changes within those regimes. However, I'm afraid that this is simply fake news, sounds good, doesn't work. <laughs> First, a lot of these so-called economic alliances disproportionately benefit the ruling elites, making them even more powerful. I'm afraid the billion dollar oil trade between the Middle East and US does not go to the pocket of ordinary citizens. They, fought, they are concentrated in the hands of the di dictators and they are used to consolidate their powers. And second, the gradual social interaction between the two countries seldom trickle down to the individual level especially due to the growing, uh, growing censorship power enjoyed by the dictatorial government. For example, in China, for foreign movies, music, books, articles to entries to the official channels, they're likely to face what I call castrations when they challenge the exist existing regime or contradict traditional values. When Jesse J's famous song, Dominoes, was broadcasted on Chinese television, they had to change the lyrics, Dirty Dancing, 
to dizzy dancing in the moonlight. Okay, so these alliances don't actually contribute to democratic transformation, but still, they are the lesser of two evils, right? I mean, often on the issue of terrorism, global development, environmental protection, democracies will have to work with authoritarian regimes. I'm sure the opposition believes that sometimes to achieve certain goals, unsavory alliance with dubious groups will have to be made. However, economic trade, military cooperation, and political dialogue does not require a tacit consent to other parties' values. Obama's administration recognized the importance of bilateral trade with China, but it did not stop them from speaking out against China's human rights abuses. A democracy can work with an authoritarian regime in certain areas, but that does not force them to be allies and tacitly consent to others' actions. Therefore tonight, just to be clear, I'm not arguing that democracies should stop working with authoritarian regimes. That is unlikely and not possible. However, I am proposing that these cooperations do not mean that democracies are allies with authoritarian regimes. It does not mean that democracy needs to stay silent in the face of human rights violations. And it certainly does not mean that democracy should do nothing and let those atrocities happen. In fact, I'm setting a higher bar for democracies to incorporate political pragmatism with ideological principles. And to work with authoritarian regimes, yet constantly pressure and challenge them in changing their ways. Sorry, it will be hard, but it will not be impossible. I mean, does anyone in this room honestly think that China will start a billion dollar or trillion dollar trade war with the United States just over basic human rights issues? Or will they perhaps just on the off chance recognize and fail for the ones, for once, face the economic incentive to finally, although reluctantly, start a process of changing their behavior for the better. Either case, I think this will have a much larger long-term impact than a delicious piece of chocolate cake shared between the two presidents in the Mar a Lago resort. So I'm running out of time here, but just to sum up, I hope that tonight you will vote in favor of the proposition and urge democracies to say the following to the authoritarian dictators. Yes, we're willing to work with you, but we will never turn a blind eye to the political prisoners that you illegally detain, the government censorship that you impose, and the social prejudice that you help reinforce. Yes, we are willing to work with you, but we will never stop pressuring you to change your ways and grant basic human rights to not just the majority, but to all of your people. And finally, yes, we are willing to work with you, but we will never be allies with you. Thank you so much, Madam President.